Shalom, shalom. This is, uh, we were studying the letter Kaf in the Hebrew letters, the, uh, the spiritual pathway, God's spiritual pathway. And we are uh, on the second week of the letter Kaf this week. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at the Kaf as a, as a numerical value, both in the ordinal position and also as in Gematria value of the letter Kaf. And so we're going to be getting into that. So I want to welcome you. Baraka Hava, welcome. Baraka Hava, Baraka Hava, I'll get it right here in a minute. Baraka Hava, uh, welcome. And uh, Shalom, Shalom to you. We uh, So let's get started with the letter call. All right, the letter call uh, is uh, the 11th letter, as I, as I spoke of. Uh, the letter cough has a numerical value of 20. Numerical value of 20. Now, the interesting thing about the letter cough and the, and the numerical value 20, 20 is a very significant letter in Judaism, uh, or number in Judaism. Uh, when a boy or a girl, uh, when a boy goes through his bar mitzvah and a girl goes through her bat mitzvah, the, uh, the boy at uh, 13 and the girl at age 12, the, uh, they become a man. They become an ish, ish man. This is the word for man in uh, Hebrew, ish. And the, uh, the word ish in, in Hebrew means man. That's what it means. And isha is woman. Uh, so a girl at age uh, 12, when she goes through her bat mitzvah, she would become a isha, and so that is a so they're considered a man, and 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 before they they become a uh, they become responsible to the Torah, they become responsible to the law, and and so forth. But that does not mean that they move out of the house. That does not mean that they leave the authority of the of the father. The father still has authority over them, um, but they are considered. To have entered into manhood and womanhood at those age. But what happens now is they are not considered a geber. A geber is a man as well. The word geber is also translated as man. And a geber it is not, not given to a, uh, a, a young person until they reach the age of 20. There again, the letter kaf, the letter 20. So Kant then talks about a spiritual maturity uh, that happens to a person. So when we're talking about the spiritual pathway that we're on, then we, we, Kant comes to us where we are spiritually mature. Now, our, now God is looking at our actions a whole lot differently than he did all, uh, up till now. So we have become... Spiritually mature. Paul writes it this way. He says, those that have tasted uh, of the good things to come, if they should fall away, there's no repentance left for them. There's no, no uh, repentance left. And why? Because they are fully spiritually mature individuals. And when they become a spiritually, fully spiritual mature individual, then that person, uh, you know, should, um, uh, you know, should, should they're responsible to, uh, for, for their, for their actions. Uh, to God on, on a higher level. So it is a higher level. We'll, we'll talk about uh, transition to, to a higher level in just a moment. But so uh, the cough on our pathway, we are now going into a higher level of relationship with with God, uh, which is interesting because the cough uh, signifies so many different things in our life uh, that is really, really interesting. The... Uh, 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 in the Old Testament, uh, in the Brit, in the uh, Tanakh, the, uh, the the temple tax, the shekel, uh, the temple tax was on those that were 20 years old, older and uh, and older, 20 years and older, and so they were recognized as uh, as taxable uh, people. That, in other words, what what happened there with the t temple tax is they they the uh, the Levites were uh, they they would give a a tax or a temple temple amount the shekel uh, for for uh, uh, for the Levites 
And the, re and the reason we're doing that is because the Levites did not have a possession of the land. And rather than take people from each tribe and make them priests, they took a, uh, a, a tribe, a whole tribe, and made them all the priests. And so they, when, when a person became 20 years old uh, and above, then they would give this temple tax to signify that, that, they, that the priests are, are their substitute uh, in, the, in the relationship between um, well, as a priesthood. And so that was kind of an interesting thing. I, I didn't cover that real clear, but um, I'm not going. To, I don't want to get into that kind of teaching. But that's basically what I'm talking about. And that happens at age 20. Uh, the census in Deuteronomy, when they took the census, it was for those that were uh, 20 years and above. So the census, uh, people that were less than 20, were not were not counted in the census. Now that's very important because. And that, that places an importance upon that person when, when, because each individual was counted. Each individual was, was looked at and counted one, two, three, the, uh, and so forth. And so each person became, uh, became important in the, in the community and important as far as uh, a numerical value uh, for God. And so at age 20, they became very important. Uh, they became spiritually mature. So, uh, in, and in the wandering, when the wilderness wandering, when uh, those that died out were those that were 20 years old and upwards. So, those that were less than 20 years old, they, when it, they entered into the promised land. So, if you were 19 and three quarters, you got to enter into the promised land. If you were uh, 20 years old, you did not. So, uh, those are the ones that died in the wilderness. Why? Because at 20 years old, they are they are responsible to God for their actions and their deeds. We'll get into that in a little bit uh, even more. The in fact, the shekel itself that we just talked about about being the tax or the shekel offering or whatever you want to call it, uh, the the shekel uh, the word actually means weight. That's what the shekel means. It means weight, and it says that the shekel was was uh, was equal to 20 garats. 20 garats, and there again is the 20. So a shekel uh, relates to, uh, to 20 as well as the 20 year old that had to pay the shekel. All right, uh, then in, in addition to that, we ha they have a phrase in, in, uh, in Hebrew, which is uh, shekul hada'at, shekul hada'at. And shikuhada means to weigh, weighing the options, weighing the options. So when a uh, responsibility, that's what that's what uh, brings to you. And so when at 20 years old, a person would be responsible for making this decision. So he's got to, he, before he makes a decision, he has to say, okay, the, the, he has to look at the good and the bad of something and make a decision. And so he's weighing the options. What are my options here? So I'm going to make the best decision that I can because I want to stay on the good side. I don't want to stay on the bad side of my decision because I'm going to have to stand before the judgment seat. I'm going to have to stand before God someday. And I'm going to have to give an account for every idle word that I've spoken, every action that I've made, and everything that I've done. And so uh, they're watchful over their words because they know that they are responsible to God and God will one day judge them for the, even the words that they speak. So they are very, they, they, they're taught from an early age that at the age of 20, suddenly now your words matter. A spiritually mature person, their words are powerful. What does it say? A right, uh, the effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A righteous man, a fully mature righteous man, the effectual prayer of a righteous man, someone that's fully mature in, in the things of God, availeth much. So uh, weighing the options uh, is, is interesting. Uh, and that's, uh, so that, that's there. Now 11 is also the, um, the ordinal position in the letter. So it is the 11th letter. And so we want to look at the number 11. 11 is written with a yud and an aleph. That's how we would write 11, yud, aleph. 
Well, the picture of the yud is a deed or a work. That's a hand, okay? The yod is a hand, and so yud is a picture of a hand, and it represents a deed or a work. The aleph uh, represents God. We talked about that in the very first videos. The, uh, the aleph represents God. And so what we have here is uh, a person that is, uh, that is a cough that has reached the age of 20 is responsible to God for their deeds. So even the old no position uh, corresponds to that. And so, uh, so that's kind of interesting how that all ties together. The, the, the word for hand, which where we get the word, uh, the, the yud uh, it represents, it also equals 20, 10 plus six plus four. You got the yud is 10, the bob is six, and the dalet is four, and that equals 20. And so we talked about the, the uh, cough being the palm of the hand, right? Well, the palm, and then you have the hand. And so both of them are cor correspond with each other, all right? So uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, where are we want to go now? Um, all right, the number 11, the number 11 is one number past 10. One number past 10. So it's the next number after 10. And it is the first one where it is the first number that we have to take two letters of the Hebrew alphabet to uh, to come to the um, uh, to be able to write it. Uh, all the rest, of, all the letters up till now is just taking one letter of the uh, Hebrew alphabet to write it. Now we have to have two letters, the Yud and the Aleph. And uh, that that tells us that uh, that that speaks to us of uh, uh, of transition. So we're transitioning now from a single uh, type in individual to a, a multiple type, uh, multiple uh, thing. So we're, at, we're, we're actually adding a letter in order to be, make, make the next letter. Uh, which, by the way, um, they, they say that 20 is the optimal age for a man to consider being married. Uh, and, there, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But uh, part of it is because it's it's a period of transition from adolescence into manhood, and uh, so so we have a transition now from adolescence into manhood at, at age twenty, physically and also uh, it relates to spiritual as well. So, uh, but that's interesting. So if somebody's been a Christian for twenty years, they should be spiritually mature. <laughs> uh, you know, don't don't. Don't uh, make too much of that. But uh, at any rate, I just thought I'd throw that in. All right. But 11, but 11 is 1 past 10. Now, 10 is the number of completion, like the Ten Commandments, the Ten Utterances for Creation, those type of things. that sh shows completeness, all right? And so uh, 1 past it shows a dissatisfa dissatisfaction for that completeness. So God has completed something, but we want to add something to it. We want to extend past that. And in fact, the letter kuf itself, if you'll see this, you have two forms. You have the form that's in the beginning of the word or in the middle of the word, and that's, uh, that's the bet form. And then you have the straight form at the end of the word that uh, looks like that, which is a kuf sofit. The, uh, the ending of, of a word is a cough so feet. And so the ending form and the uh, middle or the, or the beginning form are completely different. And so there is a pro there's a transition in this where someone goes from being bent to being straight. The, uh, and uh, so the rabbis say, say this about, the, about that, that phenomenon, about the changing. I mean, in fact, this is the first letter that has a final form, a, a sophie the form, the final form. Uh, there's four other ones, so there's a total of five. But the, uh, they, they say that, that uh, because there is a dissatisfaction, there is a propensity to, for us to want to, want to uh, be sat dissatisfied with what God has given to us. And but they say that if we remain, if we remain bent and humble before God, that at the end we we will we will be straight and righteous, and we'll be able to overcome that uh, that 
inclination and that desire to be, or that dissatisfaction to a desire to want more than what God, uh, what God, what God gives us to give to us. Um, we find a lot of that in people that they want to have. Uh, they they wish they they were as as um, uh, as somebody else. Um, uh, I've heard some people say, "Well, I wish I could preach like that person, or I wish I could teach like this one, or I wish I had the knowledge of that one." Well, you know, uh, we all are ignorant on just on different subjects. So somebody somebody said, "Well, I feel so ignorant." Uh, you know, to, when I'm when I'm talking to that person, well, probably in that subject you may be, but you're not ignorant in other subjects. Um, to give you an example, my wife, my wife makes these beautiful prayer shawls. I know nothing about them, and I've lived with her. I've watched her make them. But do you know, uh, she talks about sometimes about the material and about how she's doing some, uh, certain things with it, and and, and I, I look at it. She might as well be. She might as well be speaking to me in in another language, or or that I, that I don't understand. She might. She might as well be speaking, you know, Russian or Finnish or or, or some other uh, language that I haven't studied. And uh, because I I have no clue what she's even talking about. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, none of that makes any sense to me. And I feel very ignorant when she talks to me about the these personals because no matter how much I've watched her. I can't figure it out. I couldn't make a prayer shawl to save to save my soul. I could not do it. Uh, it, it just wouldn't wouldn't happen. She is she is extremely not only talented, but she's extremely intelligent in what she does. So, you know, do I wish I could make a prayer shawl? Well, there are times that I would like to be able to do that, but I, honestly. I'm not dissatisfied with what God has given me. He's given me, he's given me the, the, the equipment that I need and he's given her the equipment that she needs. And uh, I'm very satisfied, very satisfied with what God has given me. And uh, she's, she's very satisfied with what God has given her. So that, that's kind of an illustration. Don't start, don't start comparing yourself to another. Uh, another thing about in the marriage, and I'll just, stop, I'll just talk about this a little bit since we're talking about dissatisfaction. Be satisfied with the mate that God has given to you and be satisfied with them. So many times uh, wives and husbands both, they, they start comparing their wives to somebody else or they compare their husband to somebody else. Well, you know, uh, that isn't who God gave to you. Uh, I, I was, I, I'm always, uh, I remember one time my wife, she says, she says, well, so-and-so, uh, so-and-so's husband, they they cook they cook all the meals. They come home after work and they cook and 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 she comes home from from her job and and he he just cooks all the meals. Why don't you cook the meals? I said, well, because I don't know how to do that and I don't want to really don't want to want to do that. But uh, you know, if you if you're just you you can't you can't allow yourself to become dissatisfied because I don't cook the meals. You know, uh, when we were first married, I did cook a dish that I cooked when I was a single man, and my wife calls it a garbage dish and let me do that one, and I used to love it. I thought it was a great dish, but you know that's because you know I'm, I, I just I just not that type of a person. I'm not that type of a man. So you know she she's she's realized that I have other things that that this that the woman that has the man that, that cooks. Would probably would wish that that her husband was was like me in many areas. So you know we 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 can't get caught in the trap of comparing our mates uh, to other people and even ourselves to other people. So many times we compare ourselves to somebody, and we look at look at them and we say, "Oh, I wish I had that," or "I wish I could do that," or "I wish I did that," or "Or they're so much smarter than I am," or "They're so much better looking than I am," or "They're so much." Be satisfied with who you are. Be satisfied with the with the nose God gave you. Look, the, my my nose is large and it's red. You know, I've got a, I've got a condition. Uh, it my I have a lot of acne on my nose and it makes my nose look very red. Uh, if I eat chocolate, especially, it gets even redder. But uh, and and it's kind of they call it acne rosacea. Uh, you know, it's a condition that, that I'm with. Uh, I don't worry about it. 
Um, you know, all very children are very honest, and they they will come up and they go, "You got a red nose," and I go, "Yeah." I'll just laugh and I'll say, "Yeah, it's bright, brighter than brighter than uh, than uh, uh, Rudolph's nose, Rudolph." And they, so you know, we we have a lot of fun with it. And also a little, a little more kinder than, uh, for the, as a general rule, they don't usually say anything. Although I have been accused of being drunk, which is almost almost uh, hilarious. But anyway, um, because somebody saw me on the video and they thought my nose looked like a looked like an, looked like an alcoholic's nose. But um, very interesting comments. But uh, most of the time, most most people don't, just don't don't say anything about it. But I have, a, and not only is it red, but it's also larger than than most people's noses and it doesn't bother me it doesn't bother me. my bald head uh doesn't bother me that's 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 how i am that's who i am uh and so i, I i'm constantly making uh you know uh, i want to pe make people feel comfortable and so i'll, I'll make a little joke about uh, about my baldness about how that my intelligence is so great that it just pushed out the gray hair great gray, uh, the gray matter the gray matter actually pushed the hair out, and my gray matter got so large in my brain. So I make little comments, you know, about about uh, about that. But it, does, it never has bothered me, um, and so my appearance doesn't bother me. I'm very satisfied with who I am. I feel very confident in who I am, and I'm glad that God made me the way that I am. And I'm glad that God gave me the gifts that He gave to me, and I'm very satisfied. But the number eleven signifies a dissatisfaction to that, and so. There is a dissatisfaction of what God has given to you in the number 11. We're going to show that in the scripture. Uh, we have the story of Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau uh, is, is a very interesting thing because when Esau was born, he was born with hair all over his body. He had a superfluous amount of hair for a baby. So that he, he had an extra amount of what God normally uh, would, would give to a baby. And so uh, the rabbis say that, that because of that, uh, there was an addition to the creation. There was an addition to the completion, uh, the completed work of God. And so when, when, when uh, Esau, he had a propensity then to add, uh, to add to what God has done and what God gave him. He was never satisfied, never satisfied with what God gave him. Uh, when, when he saw when Esau saw uh, Jacob, Yaakov, when, uh, when he saw him um, with that stew, making the stew, he wanted the stew. He wanted it. He just, he could not be satisfied with what God gave him, the venison that he had just went out and hunted for. Could not be satisfied with his, his work. He had to have somebody else's work. He had to have somebody else's effort. He had to somebody else's time. He had to have somebody else's uh, stew, so to speak. And so he's, he was willing then to sell the most precious thing in the world to Jacob, his birthright, and to sell that and to trade that for a bowl of stew, red stew, red pottage. And so, uh, but in the back of his mind, he was conniving on how to keep the birthright because he not only wanted the birthright which was what what was originally his and what god would originally had had uh, had, had, uh, had bestowed upon him because of the right of the firstborn uh he wasn't satisfied with that he wanted the stew and the birthright and so he connived to get the birthright and the it, it was his downfall the uh we had the stew and the birthright. The interesting thing is that ties us all that together so, so that you know that I'm not just making up something here with Esau and Jacob, but the first time that they were that, that the word cough, cough is spelled with a cough and a pay. That's a final pay, cough and a pay. And the cough and the pay, cough, the first time it appears in the Bible, the first time it appears in the Bible is when Jacob is coming back and he's about to meet his brother Esau. And before he meets Esau, he goes to the river Jabbok. And the river Jabbok, he wrestles with an angel. And God, the angel, which is Yeshua, touches him in the 
and his hollow of his thigh, the cough, because cough is hollow, it means hollow, it's a palm, it's the hollow part of your palm, the hollow of his thigh, touches him in the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob then limps. This is a picture of, uh, of someone who has dealt with the flesh, and he, he had to deal with the, before he met Esau, he had to deal with his flesh. He had to die to himself. He had to become Israel. He had to become a prince of God. He had to break his past with, with his name Jacob, which was heel grabber, supplanter. He had to break his past with that kind of personality and become a, a different man. And so he had to get rid of the flesh, the Jacob part of his life. And he had to embrace the new name, Israel, a prince with God. But he limped from that day forward. And he, he, he went and was leaning upon a cane. And even we find in his, in his la, uh, last days, as he's blessing the children of Joseph in Egypt, and he lays his hands upon Ephraim and Manasseh, and he begins to, it says that he blesses them while leaning on his cane. So Jacob had been, was, was crippled from, the, from, the, from, from that point, point further. And so he had to deal with the flesh before he came to meet, uh, meet Esau. So that's the first time you see cough in the Bible as a word is there. The, uh, which brings us to a, to a word called uh, uh, the, uh, the cherub, the cherub, the cherubim, the, the, you might hear, uh, be more familiar with the word cherub, but the cherub is the Hebrew cherub, uh, the, and the plural will be cherubim. A cherub was an, an angel, and the, we find them all the way through the Bible. We find them uh, starting off in Genesis. At, uh, at, they were the guard, guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden. They were placed there, two of them, and they, they, they had uh, flaming swords to guard the tree of life, to keep man from getting back into the tree of life and uh, eating of the tree of life and being forever, uh, forever trapped in his sins. Then we find them, uh, find them numerous places. I'll, I'll just, uh, but we do find them in the ta the tabernacle of Moses. They are they are embroidered into the curtains. They uh, they are they and and they're they're then when we get into the holy of holies, they are over the mercy seat. They are sitting on top of the lid, on top of the kippurat, and they are they are they are sitting upon that mercy seat, and their wings. The wings are 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 almost ready to touch over the mercy seat, and that's so. You have the cough reaching over uh, in on the mercy seat. Uh, the kipper red, also another word that starts with the letter cough. But anyway, so they were they were the, the carabim were on top of the kipper red, and the uh, the the uh, atonement. Uh, and so the, what they were to do, they would usher you into the glory of God. So one, they were setting out there to keep you from the tree of life, from the Garden of Eden. The other one was to usher you into the tree of life. What is the difference? Well, Adam and Eve, they had they we they had to have a sacrifice. But once that, once we had a sacrifice system in place that represented Yeshua, then the cherubim could welcome us in because we could deal with the flesh. How, who, how the Old Testament they dealt with the flesh by putting their flesh and their sins upon the animal and transferring that and then the blood that would cover them uh, for the period of time. When Yeshua came, however, uh, he came and he cleansed us. It did not cover us, it removed the sin. Uh, much, like, uh, uh, much like you would remove, uh, remove anything from your life, just complete removal. Uh, it's not covered. It, it's it's completely gone, and so uh, uh, there had to be a there had to be uh, the cherubim then are the ones that usher us into the glory of God, and the uh, the, the presence of, of God the cherubim usher us in. There are angels that usher us in. Before you went into the holy of holies, there was a uh, altar of incense. 
and the incense that they, the spices that they made for this altar, there were 11 ingredients. There's that number 11 again. The, the, the ordinal position of the letter cloth. And so we have again now these spices, the, this 11, number 11 showing up in the spices. The last spice, the 11th spice, was a particularly bitter spice. And that is because before you enter into the Holy of Holies, before you enter into the very presence in the throne room of God, there has to be a dealing with the flesh. You have to, and it's going to be a bitter experience for us. It's going to be a bitter experience to have to deal with the flesh because the flesh does not want to die. The flesh does not want to get to give in to the things of the spirit. The flesh wants to drive us. It wants to reach out for more than what God has given to you. It wants to preach. He wants to keep you in a dissatisfied dissatisfaction with God. Why did God do this? Why do God does God do this? Why did this happen to me? Why does this happen to me? Why, where is God? Why, why can't God do this for me? Dissatisfaction with the things of God, with what God is good doing to us and, and what God is, is, is uh, leading us through. Now, so I'm not saying that, that bad things come from God because I, I do not believe that. I believe that we have a, a very bad devil and, and he, he never does anything good. And I believe but we have a very good God. He never does anything bad. But sometimes we wonder where he's at. Sometimes we're dissatisfied with the speed that he, he answers our prayer. Sometimes we're dissatisfied with, with what, 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 what he's saying to us. We, we, want, we would rather have him say something else. And so, uh, you know, that's what I'm talking about is that, that that's dissatisfaction. We need to... We need to get rid of that. We need to get our flesh out of the way and get to get those carnal desires buried and and to take that bitter bitter herb and and take that bitter bitter thing that that, that that makes it hard. Just get rid of that bitterness out of our life and get rid of those things that that that, that keep us from trusting Him, trusting Him in everything that we do. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Proverbs. All right, so uh, that's very interesting. Uh, and I'm going to end today talking about, uh, talking about the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the cough as a crown. The, uh, a good name is considered a crowning achievement for a person. A person has a good name, that's a crowning achievement in your life. Uh, you want to leave your life with, with a good name. You want to leave your children with a name that they're proud to be associated with, that they're not, they're not ashamed of being called by the name that, that, that they were given at their birth because something that their father did. They want to be proud of that. And you want to leave them the legacy of a good name. You want to give them a name that they can be proud of and a name that they can build upon. And so it's a crowning achievement for, for a man's life to have a good name. But there is a name that is above every name. There's a name that is a crowning achievement above every other crowning achievement that we can have. And that is the name of Yeshua. For God has given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. He has the highest name of all names. And he has given to us the legacy of his name. And well, I'm proud to declare his name. I'm proud to be a representative of Yeshua, of Jesus. I don't care whether you say Jesus or Yeshua. I am proud that I am a representative of Jesus. I'm a representative of him. I'm so proud of his name. I'm so glad that I have his name, that his name is given to me, that I, at the name of Jesus, I can speak 
and mountains will be removed. At the name of Jesus, I can command sicknesses to leave. I can name of Jesus, I can speak to a, a lame man at the gate beautiful, and I can say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I'm so proud of that name because it is the crowning achievement of Yeshua. And I have been given that to honor. And I honor that name. I honor his name. And I worship his name. And I thank God for his name. Thank God for the name of Yeshua. Thank God that I can call to Yeshua and he will answer me. When I ask for Yeshua, he shows up. When I say, the, even I make the mention of his name, he is there. He is as close as the mention of his name. He's probably even closer than that. In fact, if you reach out to touch him, you've reached too far. That's how close he is. If you just think about him, he's there. He's, he said, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. He is with us. Yeshua is my savior. And he is my guide. He is my strength. I am satisfied with him. He satisfies all my longings. Oh, how he satisfies me with good things. He gives me life and godliness. I'm so happy that I found Yeshua. I'm so happy that I found him. I hope you found him as well. I would like for you to, uh, I, I will play, post a link where you can purchase this book at the top of the video. I haven't uh, done that. I was running a little late, but I will do that here in just a moment. And it will be available very, very shortly. Uh, there where you can, uh, it'll be a direct link where you can order this book, The Story of the Prayer Shawl. Uh, it's very, very uh, inspirational. There is a whole chapter about the Caribbean uh, in here and uh, and the uh, regarding the presence of God and ushering us into the glory of God. Uh, it's well worth your read, just that one chapter, well worth the 1995 that the book uh, is. And I hope that you do that. My wife makes these prayer shawls. Uh, I'm making, I'm wearing one that she's that she made for me. This is my coat of many colors. It's uh, it's something that I'm so proud of. Uh, I'm proud of uh, the it's uh, just it just flows. Just such a flowing material. Uh, and this one she's painted a painting on my on the back. Uh, as you can see, she does she painted that on fabric. Uh, she does some remarkable work. This is another one that she's uh, that she's made. And uh, if you would like to, uh, if you would like to get a, uh, a personal, personally made prayer shawl, one that is one uh, one that is a unique creation, uh, just contact me, inbox me through my Facebook Messenger. I will then uh, give you the information so you can contact my wife, and she would be most happy to talk with you about making the. and how to how to explain it a whole lot better than I do and you'll be more more than uh, more than blessed to to get one of these for your own personal prayer time so I hope that you've enjoyed this video uh, I do do want to end with the blessing that I normally do and uh, put the, put that over now notice I put my hands out with my palms towards you and the reason I re reason that the priests do that is because the cough of the hand and it is it is a it is ushering you into the presence of God. It is the carabim, it is the cherub, that the wings of the cherub, the wings that are over the mercy seat, are extended to you. And when they put the put their fingers out like like that, they create five different openings. And those openings are the windows of heaven. And God looks through the lattices over in Song of Solomon. He says that he looks through the lattices. And this is God looking through the lattices to you and blessing you. The, the, uh, the priestly blessing has exactly 15 words in it in Hebrew. And 15 is the number of Yahweh. It's the uh, abbreviated form of Yahweh. It's yud Hey. 
Yah, Yah. And so uh, God said that when the priest would uh, say this blessing, that he was putting his name on them. He was putting his character upon them. And so he had 15, 15 words is the word Yah. And so he is actually putting his name upon you. The name is above all names. Uh, Yeshua, he is Jehovah. He is Yah. And that name is being placed upon you. His character is being placed upon you. All that he all that he is, all that he ever will be, uh, it will be placed upon you. His blessings will be placed upon you. And so you are receiving the name of Yah. You're receiving the name of Yeshua, the name that is above every name, when you receive the priestly blessing. So I hope you receive it today as I pronounce it over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Shalom.